We are a redemptive society. We are a people. It is a revolutionary thing. And the church then is the occasion of the conflict. What is the occasion? What's it for? You see it in both of the passages in 1 Kings 18, also in Ephesians 6. The occasion of the conflict is the church. The immediate object in view of that devil is that church. Now, you, you just mark that down. You don't know what he's after. He's after that church. I don't care if it's an individual. I'll show you this morning. We may not get through here too early this morning. If you have to stand up and stretch a little, do it. But I want you to hear me. This is what the war's against, that church. The whole occasion of it is the church. If he can put it out of business. In 1 Kings, it's the people of God. And the issue of Elijah's prayer was that they be turned back. The whole thing. Because the reason Baal is having such a field day, God's people are out of place. They backslid. They're not where they ought to be. So all hell is having a field day. Every, you look at, read the history of civilizations, no civilization ever failed till that church failed. None. No way you can put it down. And every man from Paul to Wesley to now that's affected his generation, preached to that church. He dealt with that church. There's where the warfare is. He didn't just get the man saved on the street. When he come to save, seek and save that which was lost, I can tell you there's a lot more than the soul was lost. The purpose of God was lost in that. Every man that's ever affected his generation has dealt with that church. And the reason is, that's the assault of hell. No matter how it's coming, you listen to the, you're a pastor and you're not, you don't know about this, but the phone rings all the time. I have troubles in that home over there. Problems in that home. All Satan doing, he's trying to isolate you, see, because this is a very relative thing. If you hurt, I hurt. Amen. It may not register with us because we're so carnal, but it does register in the head. He just, he's always, see the occasion, the occasion is the church. The Lord's people in view, his prayer for his people, he brings all the people together. Notice he said, come near to me. He involved those people in that issue because it's their problem. It is the whole thing is against them. They don't know it. Here they're worshiping Baal and God, but they're ignorant. They're sheep they don't know, but the man of God he brings them up because this is an issue that involves you. This is what it's after is you, the people of God. He's got you out of place, so the whole program of God is at a standstill. The rulers of that darkness are now in control in the heavenlies, and the whole thing has gone to pot, and the man of God is here telling them the warfare is just not here. It's there in, in this heavenlies, and it involves the church. In Ephesians, we know the thing that's in view. Right through the letter is a church, the body, that one new man. The whole thing, when he comes to six <laughs> and tells us to put on the whole armor of God, I mean, the warfare is against you. Why not put on armor if you're not shooting at me? <clears throat> I mean, if all he's after is Tom over there, then I don't have to worry about anything but this little coat here. Amen. I don't, I'd, I'd have no problem. But he's saying to the church, this thing is against you. A battle in the heavenlies in relation to the church. And there's two things that I want to tell you about that. A battle in the heavens, and the whole thing involves the church. God's purpose in redemption is to secure a people for his name. His son is going to have a bride. That's the whole thing. The wedding's already set. There's a day already now. There's an hour. Everything, everything is there. When that day comes, there will be a people. But there's a war going on. Satan wants that. See, God is going to give to that church what he wanted. He wanted to be his God. That is, we're not going to be God, but we are going to sit on the throne of this universe and rule with Christ. That overcoming church, that bride, when the Bible said we're heirs and joint heirs, in judicial terms, according to California law, simply means one cannot rule without the other. We will set 
on that throne with him. That's what Satan wanted. He snatched for it and fell. God cast him out. Now he sees that church coming in. And so the warfare is against that that gave birth. It's against that one. Now one, I want, are there two things you want to say? One, that's not merely a personal thing. If, this is, this is what makes us indifferent. You know, the world, when we talk about the world, but Paul wasn't writing to the world when he talked about them without natural affection. He started that letter with saints. Amen. So we're not talking about a world. They, they don't know, but natural affections, that, that, that is a family thing. We see it out there because it's in the church. The whole corruption out there is only a reflection of the corruption on the inside of that church. Clean that church up in society. We'll begin to clean up. But the whole of it is that it is a relative thing. Amen. And without natural affection, a church, we don't care about one another. That love, he said, hereby is the love of God. You love one another. They know you love me. If you can't love God whom you've never seen, how can you love your brother or sister that sits by you? We have people who don't show up. The pastor, the staff that are paid to see about such things are concerned. But the rest of the people, if your arm didn't show up in the morning, you'd be looking for that arm. Amen. People tell me that they lose an arm, have to have it amputated. Never. They're always looking. They always feel like it ought to be there. But it isn't there. That's a relationship of that body. You can't cut one of your hands off without the whole body knowing. You see, we must know that that shirts the warfare and, and, and the whole thing involved. It's a relative matter. It's not personal. The conflict relates to the whole body of Christ and the conflict of every individual is a relative conflict. It relates to all saints. If one member is defeated, the whole body suffers spiritually. It may not know why. The body may not know why. We're having a great struggle. We don't know why. But out there on the edge, there is that member I told the pastor this morning, a lot of this I got. I was watching Discovery Channel, and they had on about wild dogs. And those are some of the most vicious things on this earth, a wild dog. And showed how that they would take a herd of those antelope or something, and they'd take after it. And their whole effort was to isolate that one. And those cameras caught it. They caught that beautiful animal. And here's all these dogs around it. And it had fought, and finally it just quit and lay down. And that camera caught the eyes of that animal. And that is the most pathetic thing I've ever saw. I, I really was haunted by the look in the eyes of that animal. It finally just lay down. It's all alone. There's nobody caring now. The rest of them are keep running. And he's all by himself. All of the work of hell is to get you off over there by yourself, to isolate you. And listen, when God says, don't you forsake a semblance of yourselves together, he ain't playing games with you. You can't live without this church. You can't live without me. We have to have each other. We have to know that, you see, because when I suffer, and you may not know why that you are, but it's all related. It's a related thing. You cannot get away from that. And the enemy knows if he can just isolate you, cut you off. Then the whole body now is suffering. We don't know why, but I can tell you the head knows why. The Lord Jesus Christ, and we ought to know why. That's the reason I'm telling you this. The conflict is a relative one. When That is why the enemy seeks to isolate individual members of that body and bring such a pressure on them to crush them. He knows not just the value of an isolated member, but the relativity of that member. You see, you disturb that church, and he's on his way to victory now. Long as that church is moving in God... He, he is out of order now. He's in, a, he's in a very awkward position. He can do nothing. But if he can isolate that member, that's the reason we should watch all of us. We're members one of another. Somebody's a sinking. You don't have to have a pastor to call you to go see where they at, what's happening, what's going on. The enemy is not just after them. He's after you. And if we don't realize that, 
If we don't realize that, he'll win. Because of this, there's so much spiritual emphasis from the intelligence of the Holy Spirit upon the necessity for praying for all saints. All through this book, the Holy Ghost insisted that you pray for all saints. In the school of life, I bring out that we stand for the elect of life. Amen. The whole intercessory is for the saints, for that life, that they won't fall through the cracks, that they won't be knocked out. The emphasis for the fellowship of prayer, for the corporate prayer of the Lord's people, that, that it's a loss to Christ ahead if there's not that prayer for all saints. But saying that, the church is the occasion of the conflict. But Christ in glory is the object of it. You see, the body is the occasion because we're the vessel. But it is Christ who is the object of that conflict. You know the devil couldn't care about you. Now, you don't make him nervous at all unless Jesus is in you. He don't worry about you or 10,000 of us. It doesn't matter. But one of us that Jesus actively is alive in, he's terrified. So the war, you know, the occasions against the vessel, but the ob object, object is the Christ. The other thing about it is that the church as a body is not the ultimate thing. We must not put the church in the preeminent place. It's the occasion, but it's not the final thing. The church is his instrument, his vessel for the testimony. Without that, that testimony is lost. So he knows what to do to stop it. His testimony is deposited in that body. So it was in his resurrection. In his resurrection, that testimony was there. At Pentecost, the testimony of his victory was deposited in that body. Amen. The testimony of his exaltation, the testimony of his glorification, the testimony of his universal authority in heaven and earth, all of that was deposited in that body at Pentecost. No wonder hell has come again. All the time he was on this earth, hell sought to kill him. The first thing, they tried to throw him over a cliff. Everywhere he went, they're trying to kill him. No wonder they're trying to put you and I out of business. We are the repository of the manifold wisdom of God. He lives in us. And the occasion of the battle is against us, but what they're after is the Christ that's in there. The whole warfare, what the temple of the Old Testament was, what the tabernacle was, what Jesus was as a man, we have become. We are that vessel of God. Don't, you know, it's ultimately to strike at that glory. That's the whole thing. Exaltation. The enemy directs his attention at the elect, the vessel, the church, the body of Christ. Don't you see why he wants you and I? Why he wants to divide us? Always. If you really know this, then the next time that comes, try to whisper some little something about the pastor. You say, well, let's go talk to him about this. I can promise you most that will disappear in a moment. I left the church, been gone about a month, and one of the guys been sitting there waiting on me to leave for years to try to take it over. He went to Robert, my, my, the pastor there now, and he sat down in that office, and he began to bring accusations against me. And Robert stood up and he said, that's that me asked you one question. What have I ever done in my life that make you believe I'd sit here and listen to you talk about my pastor? Just tell me. How have I ever let myself down to make you believe you can come in this office and talk about the man that led me to God, got me full of God, and through him I was called to preach this gospel. And you think, you see, if you know if you understand what I'm telling you here now, amen, that what he's after is the glory of that Christ. And if he can divide us, that glory can be. That's what's the problem with the Ephesians. I'm a Paul myself. Well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm an Apollos man myself. Yes, sir. Well, me, I just prefer Cephas. He seemed to be. And then he can bring that about in this place. Then he has disrupted that testimony, and there's no threat to hell. But there's not the one way that to you on this altar to stay alive. And when that person comes, 
with all of that foolishness, whatever it is, you know, you just say, well, listen, let's just have a talk with the pastor about this. Who are you talking about? Tom? Well, let's go talk to Tom. Amen. Don't talk to me about him. I'm not his keeper. I am a brother's keeper in a way, but let's talk to him. You'll find most of that will disappear. Amen. You know the enemy, he's sharp. He come in and sit down in this place. He's wearing somebody's suit, somebody's dress, but he's able to pick out the vulnerable, just like that. he look around and he knows that one that's most likely to listen. And he'll come and say, you know, I, I just tell you, I, I like the way Pastor Duke preached, but I, I, I just, there's some things here that I think ought to be corrected. Well, you know, maybe you're right. And if you if you you're not careful, he'll have a division right there in that church. He'll have a little group over here, and if if you're not careful, and the only reason was you wasn't spiritually where you ought to be, you left this altar, or you'd have never listened to that in the first place. You'd have said, "You're not going to talk to me about that." Now talk to him. You don't like what he's doing. They had a family coming to the church. They're always coming. Great great friend of mine said to me the. The real secret of building a great church is knowing who not let to stay there. You see, right discernment to know. Well, they come and they 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 liked everything. They liked the preaching, liked the singing, but they didn't like the money deal. Just don't like the way they handle the money. Well, they never put nothing in the thing. <laughs> they went to one of the ushers. We have them back there just like these wonderful men here, take care of things. They said to him, said. We'd like to talk to the board. He said, that's one of the great privileges of this church. Anybody comes, talk to the board. Well, I didn't realize, but yes, ma'am, what do you want to talk? Can't do it now. She said, well, I want about Sunday morning. Well, have it set up. You come to me. Sure enough, here she come. Everything, just all, oh, everything's fine. Brought back, I'm in that office getting ready to preach, kneeling down, praying, door open. This woman wants to see the door, board, pastor, and just shoved in the room, closed the door. You the board? I said, it's according to what your problem is. <laughs> I said, if you want to donate to the building fund, I said, you can see one of them. But if it's spiritually, I am the board. As all of that, she picked up her little over on the left. I'm saying they're always, always. They're there. If she could have got over the little board, he'd like one of these city bosses, you know, got his own little... Well, they call them, you know, they, they got their own little region. I got my own people here I've got to take care of, you know. You've got that. Well, you know, I've got to figure it. No, you ain't got nobody to take care of. You just got to stay right with God. Amen. Keep everything right. See? But if there's somebody over there that they can divide this thing, then the testimony's gone. And it's people who have left that altar that are vulnerable to all of this. The warfare. When the church isn't praying, then the enemy can come in at will. And he can single out all he can find them. And so the church becomes the occasion of the conflict, although not the end. He gets it to Christ at the name, at the glory of God that's in that body. We know that was true in the Old Testament. When Israel was in a right spiritual place, when she, when she was right, they, they was in ascendancy, then the testimony of God was maintained at full strength. But when she backslid, amen, then the honor and glory of God was overshadowed and clouded. All kinds of things got into it. All things. In the New Testament, our own time, the enemy's way of dishonoring the Lord is by destroying the spiritual life of his people or breaking up the fellowship of that church. His whole thing. You hear of a church split, you know, and we think, well, another split. No, that didn't just another split. The rulers of darkness kept control of the heavenlies and were able to divide that church and make it a testimony of Satan instead of a testimony of Christ. So the church as a body becomes the occasion because of what it is, divine, what is divinely appointed vocation. God lives in us. Christ is seen to us. The enemy's bitter hatred and violent opposition is directed against the corporate life of that church. His whole effort is against that church to divide it by any means he'll seek to destroy, break up the fellowship of the saints, and get God's people 
against each other. That's the reason we read, said, watch, watch. You see, the strategic value of that watchfulness. I had pastors who watched me. I, I knew that, though I didn't know it theologically, but I did know it. I watch it. I'd see in those young people things trying to come in. I never, I never waste any time. I shot at that. I got up. I preached. I dealt with it. I called times of fast and prayer. I see that enemy trying to come in to divide that. God's working. People are being saved. People are being filled with the Holy Ghost. And here comes that enemy. He'll come in with all kinds of things. He'll send some prophet along if you're not careful. I never let him do no prophesy in that church, but he'll prophesy to him individually if you're not careful. All oh, them super spirits, they're out there everywhere. But I can tell you one thing. That, that one that comes to you privately with it, you better run from that. There ain't nothing to that. No, no. He said everything has to be done where it can be judged. Is it stuff back in the corner somewhere? You know, we was having our morning service one Tuesday morning. Two women come in. And the minute they come in, God said, they're going to try to prophesy over you now. Just like that, he told me. Amen. All the time. I just, I taught that lesson, wonderful time. And I knelt down there. And I had no sooner got down there. Both of them, I felt them hands. I took them hands. I pushed them off me. I said, oh, don't you, don't, don't, I don't need no prophecy this morning. I'm just talking to God here. He can talk to me. I don't need that. Now, I'm not saying the end times that'll happen, but I'm going to tell you when it happens, it'll confirm something in your life. It isn't somebody running around here trying to gain a place, you know, trying to gain a place. All of this is an enemy to divide. Amen. To divide. One fellow in there said, I thought you was rude. I said, that's because you didn't know what's going on. Now, just sit down over there and leave us be. I'll handle this. You know, the carnal and the ignorant spirits, they don't know what's going on, so they, they think you're rude. You're dealing with the devil. You don't play with him. You don't tell him, say, now, look, be nice with you. I ain't going to be nice. You tell him what to do. Watchfulness, the value, the value of watchfulness. Here you and I will have to do what Nehemiah did and what the apostle in this portion that we read said to watch. He said, set a watch. Watch there unto. Because as you notice in both connections, it's the wiles of the devil with Nehemiah and with Paul. It was the wiles of the devil that had you said, you got to watch. He's not going to come around here and say, I'm the devil to mess this up. He's going to come as an angel of light. Oh, he'll come in as one of you. He'll come in. That's, that's a reason. You know, a stranger, if I haven't seen him, he go to prophesy. I say, oh, no, no, hold up right there. We don't need that prophecy. You know, how do you know he wasn't an apostle? I don't, but I'm going to find out before I let him prophesy. He may be. I'm lost a thing. How do you know he ain't a devil? Sent in here by the darkness, disrupt. The Bible says, prove all things. Know them that labor among you. We've got so, we've, we've been, we've been brought to such a place we're afraid to deal with anything. You know, if it's real, you're not going to hurt it. It'll stand up. If it's real, you're not going to bother it. If it isn't real, you better bother it because it's come to destroy. We're talking about this one in prayer. You know, we're going a long ways, but they are. They're, you know, there's subtle activities in it to set a watch against the wiles of the devil and practical outworking will at least in one direction mean this, that we're quite sure that the rumors we hear are true before we repeat them. That's one of the watchfulness. You know, you can tear a church apart with a rumor. In this wicked time we live in, when there's so much going on, just the least insinuation can just start a problem that'll wind up a church in trouble when it's all over, wasn't a thing on earth to it. I mean, wasn't a thing on earth to it. But just because the rumor, but we'll know. The Bible says, prove all things. We can be divided by rumor, split up by report. We can be set at variance and apart from one another by just some little suggestion of somebody. Somebody just come along. You know, just, just make, make just a rumor. But one of the watchfulness is, I'm going to make sure that's true before I say anything. And if I say anything, I'm going to go to the people who the rumor's all about. I'm not going to go run out here and spread it abroad like you're sowing a field with seed. You're going to watch. In these days, the atmosphere is supercharged with fear and su suspicion. 
everywhere. We've had so much, amen, deceit outside, inside, every way, amen. Just a hint of the possibility of anybody being unsound. You can create a breach in fellowship. You can wreck a church. You can bring a move of God to its knees by just the rumor mill. But we'd set a watch. And we made sure we'd find that a great deal of that mess was unnecessary, unwarranted, represented a great loss to the Lord himself and his people. But when we really get to close grips, most of it we'll find is nothing. Or if there is anything, most of the time they have an explanation, and we cannot fail in all honesty of heart to accept the position as being the right one most of the time. But set a watch against these watch in your own heart. Pray through, keep praying through, and set a watch in your own heart for his methods of breaking up the corporate life of the people are beyond our power to enumerate because he knows if he can divide us, he can destroy us. It's only as we flow together can this life against those powers and principalities be it. Prayer then should be in intelligence about the wiles of the enemy, watching under prayers, watching and praying that you might discover in prayer what the enemy is really after. Where's he at in this place? I'm not going to make no deal. I don't preach the devil. And the people, if that's their own message, I don't hang around. But I've got to be aware he is around. And in prayer, where's he at? Because I, let me tell you, I don't have to guess. He's trying to get in here. That's what I feel like being here with you. I'm telling you, he don't like this tall. And he's trying to get in. But in this altar, if you really lay hold of God and plead with God about the safety and, and the progress of this church, he'll let you know where that devil is. Amen. You'll know where he is. If you don't know where he is, he'll hit you in the behind. Amen. He'll come up behind you. He, he'll, he will overrun you. But in prayer, you seek to know. Amen. What do uh, we do not want to be obsessed with the devil, but we face the facts. The facts are these, that throughout these almost two centuries, the enemy has unceasingly made it his great business to destroy the fellowship of God's people. Is that true? Is that historic? If that's true, what does it signify? I'll tell you that you can never have something that really is in any measure represents the Lord without that enemy coming. You just, you listen to these fools tell you that you get right, you'll never see the devil again. You get right, you're going to see more of him you ever saw. He's going to come. He's going to knock. He's going to push. He's going to find somebody. If he can, they'll listen to his lie. He's going to bring an accusation somewhere. He's going to, his rumor mill is going to work. He's going to. But if you stay in the right position with God, and you know what he's after is the life of God in this church, that he wants to take away from you the thing that delivered you from them drugs, the thing that set your life free, the thing that set you on a course to pray for your family. If you know that, and you know that it was found right here, then you're not going to listen. I mean, you know, I I had an old line Pentecostal man talking to me, and he was talking about women wearing a little makeup. He said, only harlots do that. I almost hit him. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Mr. I got a mother at that time. She was 84. I said, you, you read the book of Proverbs. You read about my mother. Amen. And I said, I'm going to tell you, she wore a little makeup all of her life. And right now at 94, if I went in there, she'd want to know if her face is right. Amen. But I said, you don't, you don't call her no harlot, you see. That, that, this is always the enemy of trying to ease in. Bring some little preach. He'll bring up some little some. Don't mean a thing. Amen. Best thing you ever done, got rid of it. But here he wants to bring it up as a real challenge to life. And if you're not right, he'll drive a wedge right down the middle of that thing. And the life that saved you won't be there no more. And you don't even know that you're the one that let it get away. You're not even aware. You're the ones that destroyed it. That's history. And it gives the whole game away for the devil. That that church, a fellowship, a body, rightly adjusted, is the greatest menace hell has on this earth. To that we should work and direct our attention. We need to know that the fellowship of that church. Now, the, that does not mean that we compromise with anything. I want to make that plain. 
We're, we're dealing with, the, with that whole body. We must not mean coming down from any spiritual position. We may not, we must be where, must be where Nehemiah, I'm too busy to come down there. I don't need to talk about any issues that's already settled. I don't have to talk to nobody about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Don't have to listen to no questions about the blood, about the holiness of God. I don't have to do that. But I'd set up, they must, that we must, for wherever there's life, we must try to deal with that life to bring it in to the fellowship. Whatever may be the difference of spiritual position. And you know there are people that haven't progressed as far as others. But I can't throw them out because they haven't. There must be an honest effort on our part to bring them into the fellowship and make them right. I don't mean we join up with idolatry or nothing else. And I'm not implying that, but I do. Wherever people are truly born, they are different positions. You only have to look at the Corinthian church and the Ephesian church to know that. But you don't throw them out. He has given it for his body. I finally want to, the basis of victory is the cross. It is there. Listen. It, the basis of victory in First Kings was that altar. First thing he did is rebuild that altar. The same thing was true in Ephesians. Same thing. Before you reach your, your position in the heavens for heavenly conflict, you have to pass by the earlier chapters of Ephesians and recognize a death has took place. Before you ever get to that victory down the line, you have to come through the door of those first chapters. A death has took place. An altar was there. And they having died, you've been quickened and raised together in Christ. And there's the basis. It's that altar. That's what that represents, the cross. And it was there at that altar. There are all the features of the cross, the altar implied at the beginning of, the, of Ephesians. So that the basis of victory was the cross or that altar. God, people, are a people of the altar. Amen. I, I've had people come to church and leave and said, every time you come to church, he wants you in that altar. Yeah, yeah that's it. They all just complain about, you know, they all, well, that, that tells you they needed to be in that altar more than anybody else that was there. But the complaining about always what, but God's people are a people of the altar. We used to sing about Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain. Elijah took 12 stones and the constitution of the altar with 12 stone immediately brings in the administrative feature. Because in the Bible, 12 is the number of administration. Four is the number of universality, but 12. The altar comprised of the 12 stones becomes the instrument of administration in the conflict in the hands of God. It is right there that the government takes place. I get up here and talk about what's going on. But what where the government was is here. Hell is controlled in that altar. Who rules the heaven is decided in that altar. That is, between you and that heaven is decided. And that church is decided in that altar. Those 12 stones represented the administration. God is just saying the administration is in that altar. The government is by the cross. And by the cross, where his cross, he triumphed. In his cross, he stripped all principalities and powers. And Paul said, made assure them openly. God governs through people on their knees. Not just people running out here, devil, you got to die, kind of foolishness, but a people on their knees. God governs through them. They determine what's going to happen in this church tonight. They determine what's going to be here Sunday morning. They determine whether Satan's going to rule the heavens or God's going to rule. And if God rules because it was on our knees, somebody's going to get saved, filled, healed. Something's going to happen. But those 12 stones saying that altar is the administrative place. That altar was in the exact center of the outer court. Every Israeli going to that holy place had to pass by that altar. He had to pass by that altar. I wonder if in reading those fragments of 1 Kings, you were struck with the terms, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, Israel shall be thy name. What is that? Well, Israel is a prince with God. Sons of a prince with God represent the altar, the cross. If symbolically speaks to us that the basis for our coming under our prince, governmental position in Christ, amen, is by that altar. 
That's how we come. He's greater than Israel. He is the prince of God. We are sons in him, a partaker of his princeliness. It brings into place of governmental authority in Christ in the heavenlies, and God does that by way of the altar. The cross then is a basis of victory, and what is born out again, and only with the testimony in the heaven, the word of God, but also hell bears that out. That, that is the place, because there's nothing Satan hates worse than that cross. He wasn't going to let him go there. Oh, he wasn't going to let him get to that cross. He tried to kill him every way but the way of that cross. First of all, but when he couldn't keep him there, now he'll water it down. And Paul said, by the wisdom of men, that cross is made of none effect. He couldn't stop it, so he'll make it nothing. That tells you something. That altar is a big place with God. The people of God are a people of the altar. That is the administrative. It isn't some little church board back there deciding policy, brother. I didn't administrate. The administration of the heavenlies is a people on their knees, a people who lay hold of God. That's the place where the government takes place. It's all there. Have a, <clears throat> Satan is an unwanted, unwilling witness to the truth of this. He don't want to witness that that cross is what it is. But he does, for it's perfectly clear that he hated that cross, tried in every way to keep it from happening. But when it did happen, his whole thing was to make it null. You, play, you hear plenty today about the way of the cross, but it's not the way of God's cross. It's another cross. Amen. Another cross. The very power of the cross is its registration against the enemy and all his work. Sin is a principle, evil is a state, and a nature. The power of the cross is taken out when you speak about it in any way but what it is. But the whole thing is, who's going to rule the heavens, as far as you and I are concerned, is determined by people who pray, not by any other way. You don't preach him. That message, preaching prayer, he, he, he can sit there and enjoy that himself. He can talk about that man. He's a pretty good speaker. But there's nothing registered that wasn't registered first. Because the determination of who will rule the heavens is determined on our knees. Let us stand. Hallelujah. 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 We'll deal with the ultimate thing here, folks. We've learned how to be religious. We've learned how to do things. We've learned how to talk in tongues. The one thing you don't learn how to do is pray. You learn to pray by praying. They didn't say, teach us how to pray. They said, teach us to pray. And when you and I come to really, if the revelation of the thing grips us, that the administration and government of heaven is the cross, the altar. It is there decided who will rule, who won't rule. You can go through all of these warrior conferences you want to. But when you understand that the authority, no man is ever so tall as when he's on his knees. No man ever stood so high as when he bowed in the presence of God. And there recognize the universality of prayer. And we bind those strong men, the rulers of darkness, the wicked, the rulers of this world at that altar. And we set that watch we guard our own tongues. And I don't speak that which may divide this church. If I hear something, I go to the man of God and I say, look, there's something trying to get a hold of it. True or not true, this is going on. But never, never move that on. Dr. Mr. Mueller used to say, never repeat one bad thing you heard about a man. Talk to God about it. Don't involve yourself in that which would divide. And don't let anybody use your ear for what would divide. How many of you in this place this morning are saved in this church? Raise your hand. You were saved right here in this house. Look at that. You're saved in this house. The biggest thing the enemy would like to do is to take that life out of here that saved you. And you know what he'd like to do? Use you as an instrument to do that. If he can use you as that rumor mill to divide this, 
then that life is gone. And when it's gone, you'll be running around trying to find some place where there's life. And instead of repenting, you'll be complaining because there's no place where it's alive. But the best thing is to understand, settle it at this altar today. You're not going to be the tool of Satan. There is no perfect church on this earth. But I can tell you, wherever the Holy Ghost chooses the light, you better guard that deposit. And if you have anything in that life of yours, if you've been a victim of that rumor mill and you've listened, you need to make it right with God and whoever else you need to and tell him, I won't be that anymore. There is a famine, you believe this, in this land for what you have here. And many of you may have in your church where you come. I'm just talking because I'm here. But I can tell you one thing. It's a scarce commodity. And the one thing hell wants to rid it of is that testimony. That that saved me. Let's come to the altar. We've talked about prayer. Let's pray.